I recognize the member for Vancouver, Pont Grey. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. You know, if, I, if it wasn't for that last line, I would have forgot we were debating a bill here in the House that was making proposals around specific amendments to the rules around LNG. I would have thought that we were hearing a two-minute statement about uh, the government's aspirations. In any event, let's talk about the bill. And there's a reason why the member doesn't want to talk about the bill, Honourable Speaker. It's a very good reason, because it's terrible legislation. It's embarrassing legislation for this government. Now, this new bill, Bill 19, the bill that's on the table that the member didn't want to talk about, amends the old bill that was passed in 2014, which is now law. Now that law, the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act, gave a license to industrial polluters to, to buy the right to dump as much carbon pollution into our atmosphere as they can afford. It's now law in BC. That's the law. It was a very permissive law. And this law amends it to make those rules even more permissive. Now, in, in addition to creating, as they did with the old law, a system where the province sells a license to pollute, it exempted all of the emissions from the wellhead all the way to the plant. Emissions associated with the extraction of the gas, the flaring of the gas at the well, fugitive emissions, venting of the gas, leaks from the pipelines, none of those were counted under the old bill. It was as if the emissions didn't exist, except, of course, that they actually do exist. You know, Honourable Speaker, if you want to pollute uh, in British Columbia, it only costs $25 per tonne of carbon dioxide emitted under the old law that this government brought forward that the new law amends and makes even more permissive. You can emit as much as you want. In fact, the cost might even be lower because under the law, you can buy BC offsets at, quote, market prices. Well, there's no market, Honourable Speaker, so who knows what that means. Now, it was February when the Minister of the Environment, and keep in mind, this new law makes it even more permissive. It was February when the Minister of Environment for this province said of the old law, it was only a few months old, really, that it would have the very significant effect of blowing us right past our 2020 targets for greenhouse gas emissions even if the companies don't take advantage of this license to pollute, which the province will sell them cheap. Now, on February 29th, I'm going to quote the Minister of Environment. February 29th, she said, quote, as I've said, and as the report, the Climate Leadership Report outlines, we are not in line to make our 2020 targets. The team, of course, recommends establishing a new 2030 target. The team the Minister is talking about is BC's climate leadership team. That team recommended a new 2030 target for polluting greenhouse gases. The old bill, which became law, was so weak and the emissions from these proposed plants so huge that we had to rewrite the target for our emissions. This is the context for this bill that's in front of us today, which weakens the old bill, which was so weak itself to start with. And it wasn't enough that the law was weak. It wasn't enough that we had to rewrite the pollution target. More had to be done to let these companies pollute even more. Two weeks ago, the Premier chose a person who in the time of Galileo would have been leafleting to say that he should be put in prison for saying the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. In the time of Columbus, he would have been worried about Columbus sailing over the edge of the world because the Premier chose a former director of the Climate Denying Fraser Institute to set to implement the new 2030 target. Now, this is a person who, Honourable Speaker, when he was the editor of the Vancouver Sun, he said coal would be a great way for BC to generate electricity. And, and he described global warming in 2008 as follows. Global warming is the latest weapon in the West's arsenal to subjugate and impoverish millions of people in the third world. Is it? Is it? Not satisfied by saying that global leaders who are stepping up to fight climate change were trying to impoverish the third world, he went on to say, quote, Western politicians have now grabbed the global warming club to beat up the developing world. By using this moral high ground, saving the planet, they can claim they are just trying to do the right thing, and it has nothing to do with erecting barriers to trade. Then again, the old colonialists justified their racist behavior by arguing they were just trying to civilize the savages. So after comparing leaders taking action on climate change 
to racists after recommending dirty coal power for electricity in British Columbia, of all places, Honorable Speaker, Mr. Millar was appointed the head of BC's Oil and Strategic Initiatives Division, responsible for seeing oil development in BC. And now, where is he? He's the leader of BC's Climate Action Team. Well, congratulations to him, but what about the rest of us? Uh, Premier put a man who thinks we should burn coal for energy in charge of our Climate Action Team on top of a bill that sells the right to pollute as much as these companies want. Astounding. We can see how this will turn out, how it's been designed to turn out. And now we get this bill, Honorable Speaker. That is the context for this bill in front of us in the legislature. At least under the old law, the government could argue that polluters had to buy a license to dump as many greenhouse gases as they wanted into the atmosphere in BC. $25 a ton or cheaper if it's market prices. Now, under this new bill, you don't even have to buy the right to pollute anymore. Polluters get the first 18 months free. Unlimited pollution for 18 months. It's like a desperate cell phone company, Honourable Speaker. But it's not. It's our government. But they certainly are desperate. They've already offered super deep discounts on the royalties. We're doing a royalty giveaway, Honourable Speaker. Hey, says this government, hold on. It's worth it if there's at least one LNG plant to talk about during the election in May 2017. Give away anything. Dump as much pollution as you want into our atmosphere. Just build one plant, someone, anyone, please. Please. Now, some members of this place may remember something called the Pacific Carbon Trust. Remember that, Honourable Speaker? Now, under that debacle, money was transferred from hospitals and schools to oil and gas companies, supposedly in a bid to make government carbon neutral. Now, the schools and hospitals, they could have spent the money putting in insulation, replacing their windows, doing desperately needed retrofits on their own facilities to reduce their emissions. But instead, the government said, take the money that's supposed to be spent on students, on the sick, and send it to Encana, a highly profitable gas company. Now, the scam was called a scam by the Auditor General, as it should have been, and the whole thing collapsed on itself in a scandalous outrage, as it should have. Well, here we are in this bill, Honourable Speaker. If that wasn't enough, with the return of the Pacific Carbon Trust, Part 2. Now, Section 6 of the new bill opens this uh, proposed BC Carbon Registry to companies and municipalities. Now, in other words, the same discredited model of the Pacific Carbon Trust is haunting us again. New fictional carbon credits, same government that gave out dubious carbon credits to Encana and this Darkwoods project, that were things that were already going to be done. Carbon credits were created and then sold to hospitals and schools. This government's going to allow these fake carbon credits to be sold to LNG companies as a license to pollute. Now, I'll say, I said a couple times, Honourable Speaker, that these are fake credits. And I don't say that lightly because cap and trade is a serious thing. There is a cap and trade market. California is participating in it, Quebec participating in it. It's being explored by Washington and Oregon. We were actually, under legislation, part of that. You know, audited carbon credits that were looked at by a third party to make sure they were real, that they weren't fake. Bill 2, the old bill that this government passed into law, specifically repealed our participation in that real system. No. So now we have our own system. After failing once, we're going to do it again. Fake credits in, real polluting emissions out. What a debacle, Honorable Speaker. Now, I'll be voting against this desperate Hail Mary pass of a government weakening already non-existent standards around pollution, 18 months of unlimited pollution into our atmosphere, giving away our public resource at record low rates, putting a man who advocates burning coal for electricity and calls leaders taking action on climate change akin to racists as the head of their climate action team, reconstituting a discredited carbon credit scheme that ended in scandal. They even want to build an LNG plant right on top of the eelgrass beds, essential for, for juvenile salmon. Wild salmon that are the heritage of First Nations that are the 
right of our children, our children's children, and their children. In the mighty Skeena River, this government will do anything to get at least one plant, Honourable Speaker. Mark my words, they will do anything to get that plant. And this bill is evidence of that. And why are they so desperate, Honourable Speaker? Because the real economy, not, not the plants that don't exist, but the real economy, the mills, the mines, of these same areas where the plants are proposed, it's tanking. This government needs to do something, anything, Honourable Speaker, even if it's a giveaway, even if it's a polluting disaster, even if it destroys a precious natural resource. Let me make a list of just some of the mines and mills closed over the last 18 months. These are closures decimating the economic base of rural BC where these plants are proposed. The Salmon Cannery in Rupert, Wolverine Mine, Willow Creek Mine, Trend and Roman Mine, 380 jobs there. Quintet, 80 jobs. Mount Polly, oh, reopened, reopened. Myra Falls, 300 jobs. Max Molly, 65. Gibraltar, 114 jobs. Highland Valley, 80 jobs. Treasure Mountain, 20 jobs. Avino Silver and Gold Mine, 60 jobs. Coal Mountain Phase 2, 100 jobs. Quinsome, 66. Yellow Giant, I don't know how many people were working there, a lot. Huckleberry, 100 jobs. HD Mining, now that's 51 temporary foreign workers, but still, Honourable Speaker. Canal Flat Sawmill, Houston Forest Products Sawmill, Elk Falls Paper Mill, Howe Sound Newsprint Mill, Chetwin Mechanical Pulp Mill, and the partial closure of the Howe Sound Pulp and Paper Corporation. Now, commodity prices are low, Honourable Speaker, but hydro rates, BC's advantage for decades, are up 74 percent from 20, 2001 to 2015. That hurts all of these companies badly, clearly. And while the government in this bill and in others has been falling all over itself to get the government of Malaysia over here and their crown corporation, Petronas, to take our gas for record low prices, to dump whatever pollution they want into our atmosphere for 18 months for free, have been engaging in this conduct while the real occupations, the real jobs, the real mills, the real mines of people of British Columbia are closing and they are desperate and they are looking for help. Now, that's a tough political message in 2017, Honourable Speaker. A politically desperate government is dangerous to the public interest. That's what we're facing here in this bill. A disaster for the public interest put forward by a desperate government. I'll be voting against this bill. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you, ma'am.